or even stepping, just stepping close by and uh, planning for the foot orientation. So, um, and we should really do this during during tight maneuvers or close to clutter. Um, the problem is, however, that we have these uh, demon robots, as we all know, is they have a very high um, number of degrees of freedom. Even now, if it's a simple model, I would say it's 25 degrees of freedom. Uh, so it's really hard to, to plan for all these degrees of freedom um, just for navigation, because uh, we cannot uh, plan for 10 hours just to make a stop. Um, so the solution uh, for this is then that we just plan for the possible foot locations. We see this here. And now the robot can accurately plan passing through this path, uh, narrow um, passage. And if we have a controller that enables us to, to walk on these two locations, then the robot can pass through the collision free. Um, so, so, a little bit more of context where, where this uh, kind of footstep planning module stands in, in this uh, motion planning or motion generation pipeline. Uh, let's assume for now that we have a sequence of footsteps starting from the left, going to the right. Um, then, what we can do with this is we can generate a ZMP trajectory. Um, zero moment point in this case, it, it means that um, um, our uh, zero moment point needs to remain within the support polygon. So when the robot is, while the robot is walking, it's moving the zero moment point from one foot location to the next, and during the double support phase, it transitions to the next foot. And then the robot is free to move this foot to the next location. So this is straightforward to generate this uh, desired CMP trajectory. Then let's assume we have some black box that generates the center of the mass trajectory, you get to the blue, and from this then we can generate the motion with inverse kinematics, for example, which gives us the joint angles at the very bottom. And this, for example, was introduced by Kajita, this, this method in 2003, the part table model, uh, this is the sort of thing that generates the center of the mass trajectory, and I, I think if I get it right, we will hear more about this tomorrow morning generating these, these motions. So for now, let's assume once we have the footsteps, we can execute them. So the problem is how can we plan these footsteps so that we can navigate collision-free in environments. So one method um, that also came up very, very early already is um, a stop search, very popular. For, for planning motions in 2D already, so let's just apply it to footstep planning. Here the search space now is in x, y, and theta because we're planning for foot orientations as well. We have a discrete set of footsteps, which is kind of the kind of branching factor of our search tree. And if you now apply the A star search on, on this search tree, uh, we we'll get, can get an optimal solution. Another method. Um, is this uh, sort of randomized footstep planning. Um, here we're planning footstep actions with RRTs or PRMs. Um, the nice thing here is that this uh, will give us fast planning result. Um, and um, we can have a high number of actions. If we go back to the search here, we have a discrete set of footsteps. Um, so in order to search efficiently, we want to limit this to say maybe 10 or 20 footsteps. We don't want to plan for every possible footstep because this uh, will really impact the search performance. Whereas here, with randomized methods, um, with the approach by Harry and Carlos from France, um, they have 200 or, or even more so-called half steps, which are then concatenated with steps so that they play the high branching factor. That's why they're using these randomized methods. The problem here with these randomized methods is, as we as you also may, may know, compared to the A-star, is that there is no guarantee on optimality or completeness. So we just need to plan, and if the plan returns in a reasonable time, we can assume, okay, there is a solution, but if it doesn't return, maybe there's only a more complicated solution. We don't get an immediate feedback if the plan or the goal location is reachable at all. Could you please repeat the RRT and PRM is what? Yeah, our RRTs are uh, rapidly growing random trees, and PRM are holistic growth maps. So these are randomized methods. They're very similar, and they only and they're sort of how they work. Um, so if you if you familiar with A star, you have this search tree that you're going through, and you're expanding uh, actions at every step. And the PRMs or the 
randomized methods, you're randomly exploring the propagation space. The propagation space here can be these footsteps. So you're, you're randomly uh, looking at which footstep may go into the goal direction, and uh, this here leads to very, very wide uh, expansion of the search space. But you, 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 you will never explore the whole search space, so um, you can construct arbitrary planning problems wherever this will fail. But in practice, especially for planning uh, high degree of freedom motion, like whole body motion, are usually planned with these methods. So let me uh, briefly recapitulate the A star search, since uh, this will be the, the main topic of my talk. Um, You've probably all heard of it before, since it's a very popular method, not only in, in robotics. Um, it's a best first search, um, which uh, will find the cost optimal path to the goal state. So given all the boundary conditions, given my environment discretization, and uh, given my cost function, A star is guaranteed to give me the optimal result, if the below properties hold. And we'll get to this in a second. So, um, a star will uh, have an um, evaluation function, so it uses, um, if you look at the evaluation function for a state that it's currently expanding, then we have g of s, these are the cost from the current start to the state that we're in. And then we have a heuristic part, the h, which tells us how, how good is this state, how likely is this state to end up uh, leading to the goal. And this was what makes a star efficient, for example, compared to the Dijkstra search which really looks at all possible states. So here we have a heuristic, which um, informs the planner which direction is, is the goal. And if this heuristic is well chosen, or if, say if this is perfectly informed heuristic, then A star will only expand one branch of the search tree, because the heuristic will always lead us to the per perfectly to the goal. But of course, if we have a perfect heuristic, then what's the point in planning? So this is kind of the... the the trade-off here that uh, you will have a very well-informed heuristic, but usually you will have some, some, some trade-off because heuristic, uh, we'll get to this uh, later and I'll show you some examples. Uh, but, um, the important point is uh, so that A star will give you the optimal solution, that uh, is the heuristic is admissible. So it may never overestimate the cost to the goal. It may give you the exact cost to the goal, it's very well-informed, Otherwise, it may underestimate. So a very popular choice is just taking the um, Euclidean distance from the current state to the goal. Because this will be the shortest path, path, the shortest path possible if there are no obstacles around. Otherwise, you have to walk around them. But yes, this heuristic is uh, obviously admissible here. And if you think of 2D planning, then we have a, a sort of grid, some grid world, uh, where we have the x, y coordinates as states. And um, the neighbors are then simply the four connected or eight connected neighborhood in this representation. Um, then we can plan 2D path very efficient. Uh, it's also very heuristic. Working on this grid um, can be very well important. But uh, that's for basically star search here. Uh, let's get to footstep planning now. Um, it's sort of a or this formal <coughs> definition of the planning problem. Um, so as I briefly mentioned before, we have a state. It's x, y, and theta because we have to plan for orientations even if we're in 2D. These footsteps are kind of represented by a rectangular bounding box of the actual foot shape you see here. The right foot is a stance foot. It's given by a width and a height. And then we have uh, one stepping action with the left foot. Um, it's given by the 2D displacement and orientation, as you can see here. Um, state is given by theta. Um, these are stepping actions again. And um, what we are assuming for now is that we have a fixed set of footstep actions. So we have a um, defined set of footsteps that is given by the robot configuration, the robot kinematics. If you, uh, for example, think of the now, it has some uh, API functionality that enables you to step to certain locations with one foot. Um, they have a maximum delta x, a maximum delta y, and a maximum, maximum uh, orientational change. And then what you do is you want to discretize the stepping range into a set of useful stepping motions. Um, 
you get the successor state of the current state by applying the transformation given by the action. So we're simply ending up in this state, S2 S prime, by applying this transformation. And hereby we assume that the, the walking foot changes during every state transition. Otherwise, we have to um, include the, the foot into the global state representation. So we'll just leave it away here because to walk into any kind of direction, we'll have to alternate the foot. Otherwise, I'm just going to stay here and move my foot. Um, um, and if we do this, then we have to come up with some useful cost function. And the idea here is since we want to find efficient paths to the goal, um, that these costs should somehow reflect the execution time. So now you can either assign an execution time to each of your steps if you're measuring them, or you're going to assign a sort of um, heuristic costs, uh, which say that the execution time depends on how far I'm stepping, so longer steps take a bit longer, and I have some constant steps because this depends on my uh, step frequency of the walking controller, and I'm, you can also add some distance costs here. Um, these are based on distance to obstacles, uh, it's kind of opti uh, optional, which um, may give you some more robust uh, results if you consider foodie planning. Um, this is a typical cost term that's introduced there. So you would prefer, you would slightly prefer paths that stay away from obstacles, but if you have to, you will go close to obstacles. Otherwise, you will always. But if you formalize it like that, wouldn't the robot just take maximum steps all the time until the last step? Because if this k is large enough, then so the robot would never actually take intermediate steps. It would only take like the maximum steps. Yeah. So, so you need to weight this appropriately. Yeah. So this should be um, less than the smallest step here. Uh, so so uh, this is just a, a, kind of the general idea. Of course, you want to weight this differently. Um, but the idea is really that if you're walking forward, you want to take the maximum steps, unless you have to change orientation and, and you, you can take the maximum steps. But this is exactly what we'll see. Typically, we're walking forwards and there are no obstacles around. We can choose any kind of location then. This, this is also why, why the K is in here. So we, we, are, we want to prefer making less steps. And at the bottom right, you see a slightly <laughs> shaded uh, right stance foot and left and a set of, uh, it's not coming out too well on the beamer, unfortunately, but you see a, a set of stepping locations. Um, these are none of them now, but these are something like Asimo or HRV2. Um, you can see some. This one's very large steps, so it's actually stepping well, <coughs> step, uh, further than its, than its uh, foot size, so it can really step over obstacles with this. So let's have a look at uh, one example of the planning process how all this works with A star. Um, we're starting with the right stance foot. Then we're looking at uh, foot candidates for the left foot, shaded in red here. Um, of course, you want to walk to the goal, so it's a, uh, it's a good choice to pick the step that's closest to the goal. Then we're looking at the next one, and we apply our footstep candidates for the right foot, which are the same selected, but the foot just mirrored, um, and so on until we reach the goal. So uh, what happens here in, in each single iteration, if you come back to the A star, um, we have the, the path cost from the start to the current state S. This is GFS, we know this because we started planning from here, and we go all the way here. So these are the actual costs summed up over the previous actions. Um, then we have the transition costs. We're looking at all our footstep candidates for the left foot. Let's look at this foot, for example. We have uh, our transition costs, which are, again, the actual costs. And then we're looking at how likely is this state going to end up closer to the goal. And these are the heuristic costs. So now the heuristic costs for this location are um, the smallest because it's closer to the goal. So we're going to pick this one. Uh, say if the goal is here, then this would have the um, smallest heuristic cost, uh, which will lead to the robot walking sideways. So now an kind of interesting question is um, what does H of S or H of S prime look like um, and how does it deal with obstacles? So say here is an obstacle blocking the path of the robot. Uh, if the robot can step over this obstacle, 
then we wouldn't really care about it because then our heuristic is still trying to go over the obstacle. Um, but if this is say a wall, then our heuristic points to the goal, but the robot will have to walk around it. And this creates a local minimum in the search space, which is one of the, the, the problems that a star may potentially search, uh, potentially um, face. Um, especially if you have lots of obstacles and uh, complicated environments with walls or have. Um, here are two um, typical Heuristics. Um, since they're very critical to the performance of the planner, um, so it's a good idea to, to think about these heuristics. And if you come up with a very well informed heuristic, then best use it for your use case. Um, the ones that are typically used uh, is the Euclidean distance to the goal. Uh, it's just pointing straight toward the goal and looking at how far it is. Um, so, as we just saw, or as you see here, is that this may be really not well informed, since this would force the parent to look at all of these states. Because all of these states are are pointing towards the goal. Say all of these states um, have a lower cost, lower heuristic costs of reaching the goal um, than for example the one up here, which we eventually have to look at and we want to have pass on the obstacle. So another very popular choice um, is the 2D path, which you can plan with uh, Dijkstra on a 2D grid, or even with A star, but Dijkstra is a good choice because usually you want to do this for the whole map and for every state. So for every state, we're pre-computing a, a 2D path towards the goal. This can be done really, really fast since it's just a 2D grid, not looking at the orientations, not doing any grid checks. Um, so for example, from this state, the Dijkstra path would go around here. So if your robot cannot step over obstacles, for example, the, the now robot, unless you modify the stepping capabilities. Um, and this is a good choice because this will re closely reflect the actual path that the robot takes. And in this case, it's more informed of the environment. <coughs> Since we're um, dealing with a 2D shape of, of the computer, <coughs> Form some uh, sort of collision check in the environment. Uh, we assume that we have the environment given and we know what is free space, what is obstacles. In this is a good representation of the group there. Um, then, at every node expansion, we need to check is this state actually performable by the robot or will it step over an obstacle? Because otherwise, we won't look at it any further. So, the footprint for now, we assume that it's rectangular because these. Uh, responds to most of the humanoid speed, and if it doesn't, you can approximate the foot by a rectangle bounding box. Um, and if we just evaluate the distance, so we look at the pre-computed distance field or a distance map, uh, for example, with, with OpenCV, the dist uh, 2D distance transform, if we just look at how far is the center of the foot away from the closest obstacle, um, then this will work, but it won't work close to obstacles because it neglects the orientation. But there you can, up, you can come up with this rectangular uh, recursive subdivision of the foot. It's a really nice thing because you can still work on these very efficient distance maps, uh, but you're going to consider the rectangular shape of the footprint. And how this works is we're first looking at the foot in circle, the RI, and then looking at the foot out outer circle or circumcircle. Um, so if the distance to the closest obstacle given, so we're looking at this uh, location here in the 2D distance map because here is where we want to place the foot. Um, now if our distance map tells us that the distance to the closest obstacle is smaller than our foot in circle, then we can stop looking further because we know that this will definitely collide with an obstacle. And if it's larger than the circumcircle of the foot, then we know that this is sufficiently away from the obstacle. So we can continue planning because uh, this foot location will be safe no matter what our orientation is. Um, in any other case, say this is the trend value D, given by the dashed line here, um, then we will subdivide our foot rectangle here into two further rectangles because now, we know that this is the distance, 
And um, so this tells us that um, this inner area of the foot is actually is, is safe. But we need to look at R1 and R2, and we need to continue branching out until we reach, we reach the lowest level, or um, we have some distance that's larger than the remaining circumcircles of these rectangles. Uh, this is very efficient because you can use these uh, pre-computed 50 distance maps. Um, it was introduced uh, by my colleague Christoph uh, for rectangular robots originally, um, but it really works well for human robots as well. Um, some more extensions that we need uh, to perform footstep planning uh, with this uh, A star search. Um, if we've, looking, if we've uh, looked at the state expansion of the foots that's uh, subsequent, that's uh, iteratively built, then um, you may notice that this is not uh, exactly looking like the 2D A star search because it's not expanding every state. If we are planning for 2D, uh, we're always expanding the neighbors in the state space. But here we're making these stepping capabilities, so we're actually stepping over the direct neighbors of a state. So this builds a kind of uh, state lattice, so, um, which means that our state space doesn't need to be fully defined, but only the states that are relevant. Um, and this um, is very similar to motion planning for a weird robot with, with, with kinematic constraints, where we have these motion primitives which tell us I can drive a meter forward with this velocity, or I can drive in an arc, but I can't go sideways. So there. Uh, same thing, but we're only looking at the states that make uh, kind of sense in this kinematic um, coordination. And here it's directly reflected by the stepping capabilities. Um, we're adding only the valid states after a collision check, um, but if you have a discrete set of steps, then the problem is that our goal can be um, any kind of position and orientation as the user specifies or as our uh, task demands. So. If you think of a discrete stepping set and any kind of orientation, then this doesn't really match up. Um, so we will end up, if say, if I have to go here, and I can't reach it directly, then I will start walking around the goal until I finally reach it. Maybe it takes a minute or so, uh, depends on your stepping capabilities, when I exactly reach the goal. So then you simply have to perform uh, kind of this fuzzy goal check. Um, so in addition to your uh, step set, you need to have some valid stepping range. And whenever the goal is within the stepping range, you're adding this step transition to your general lattice. Um, with all these formulations in place, uh, we can now apply any kind of heuristic search. A star is the first one that comes to, to your mind usually. Uh, the nice thing here is that there is also already a library for this. Uh, it's in ROS, but it's also available standalone. It's called SPPL, the Search Phase Planning Library originally developed by Max Likachev from CMU. And there's a wide number of banners in this library. Um, it, it doesn't even have a plain A star because it's all kinds of uh, extensions and we'll, we'll get to this. Um, and on top of this, uh, we published um, our Footstep Planner implementation which uses SPPL. So it will take care of all the um, formulations and all the bridging between um, this footstep representation and the search representation on SPPL. So um, let's uh, come back to the local minima in the research space that I briefly mentioned um, in the introduction or in the introductory example. Um, Let's consider this example where the robot starts here and the goal is behind this wall. And as heuristic, we're using the Euclidean distance to the goal, which points straight across the wall. Since A star will uh, search for the optimal result, it's actually forced to expand all of the area. See the blue, um, the blue shaded area? This is the states that the planner expands. In order to reach the goal, it will have to look at everything going around this, uh, this wall. Um, now this is nice um, if we actually looking for the optimal example and we have to do this, but usually when we're doing navigation, um, I think we're pretty happy with a kind of suboptimal result. 
Uh, we don't want uh, a random result, which can be arbitrarily uh, suboptimal, but what would be nice to have is a provable suboptimality. So we have an upper bound on how, how worse this path is compared to the optimal solution. If we can have this, then um, we'll get more, or if we can get faster results and we're not forced to expand all this area, then I think we're pretty happy with accepting some optimal result. Um, and the nice thing here about this uh, search based planning is that it's still very goal directed because it's using the heuristic um, and it's giving you an upper bound on the optimality. And you will even get some some um, some some nice properties uh, that you can, for example, improve the path while you're walking. So. We're, we're not interested when we, so the robot starts planning from start to go. Um, it's, it's, it's good to know that the path exists and what it roughly looks like, but usually um, it's, it's uh, kind of a waste to get the optimal path, wait for a minute, and then start walking on this optimal path. Um, but instead, you can get a suboptimal path first, you start walking towards the goal, and while you're walking, you can iteratively improve this path. Um, and one planner which, uh, may, which enables you to do so is the Anytime Repairing A-Star. Um, how it works is it um, uses A-Star search, but not uh, with the plain heuristic, but with an inflated heuristic. So you see this in the top, it's, it's using the weighted A-Star. And how this works is very simple, it's taking the heuristic and it's inflating it by a factor of W or epsilon. Then if I now Every value the heuristic gives me, if I multiply it by 10, then I get a 10. I get a, at most 10 times suboptimal path. You, you can prove it, and it's in the paper by Lipschitz and Lipschitz um, before. And this is only an upper bound. Of course, the solution will be very goal directed, and it, it won't be. It won't have 10 times the distance towards the goal. But usually, it's a, maybe a factor of 2 or 1.5. Um, but this will be really, really fast. This result, because um, it's greedy towards the goal. Now this is weighted A star, and um, this will give us these sort of 3D uh, results. Um, but a nice thing about the anytime repairing A star is that it's using weighted A star iteratively, and it can reuse the state information from previous ones. So what it does is it starts with a weighted A star search with an initially high inflation factor W. And then you give it a time limit, it will decrease this W the longer it is at its time. So you can say, I, I want a navigation result in five seconds, and if there exists, exists a plan, you will get it in five seconds. And it will give you the upper bound on the suboptimality. You can do this yourself if you trust you do use weight A star, but you will gonna end up planning over and over and over again. So why not plan for the optimal result first? Um, but any recurring A star will reuse the information from the previous ones. So in some occasions, it can even be faster than a plain A star search when it's it's uh, ending up at the tumor result for W equals 1. Let's look at an example run. Here we are still using the Euclidean heuristic, and already here you see for inflation, say, W equals 10, you will get a path that's really goal directed. It takes a larger turn here, but it's expanding only small areas in front of this local minimum. And now we're, we're giving ARA star some time, and it's running again and again and again, and it's decreasing the W until it reaches W equals 1, and of course this reflects A star search, so it will be forced to expand the same state in the end. But if you give it a time limit, if, say if this takes 5 seconds to compute, and you want your result within 0.5 seconds, then you just give this time limit to the planner and it will maybe stop at W equals 5 and you will get a really well directed yeah. Sorry to interrupt, what's W? Mm -hmm. What's W? The, the, the symbol uh, W. The W? Mm -hmm. W is the inflation factor of the heuristic for the weighted A star. So, in every iteration, the ARA star is uh, running weighted A star and W is the weight for weight of E star. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a heuristic inflation factor. So you take heuristic value and just multiply it by W. Okay. And now instead of, say, this returning 2 meters or heuristic value of cost of 2, this will give you 20.
And the upper bound for the solution in any kind of environment uh, will be given by the inflation factor W. So um, in this case, we know that there is a wall and the robot cannot step over it. Why not use um, the Dijkstra heuristic? So this is really nice for, for W equals 1. So this is telling you the planner, give me the optimal result. You see that it's expanding noticeable less um, states. And in fact, um, this took only two seconds to compute, whereas the, the, the last one took maybe 10 seconds to compute. So the number, expa number of expanded nodes number of expanded states directly reflects the planning time here. Uh, in addition, it will also fill up your memory if you're really uh, planning in a high dimensional space or with very dense or high resolution, uh, then all these expanded nodes will fill up your memory eventually. Uh, so with the 2D path, it's looking at the, maybe it can go over on the right or around the top, uh, so it will only expand these areas because this 2D extra heuristic will point around this obstacle. Because uh, this, <coughs> um, so if I understand it correctly, you're running A star on the footsteps, which uh, which are x y, or d x d y, and and uh, changing yeah. orientation. <coughs> and so to speed that up, to improve your heuristic, you're calculating a, a heuristic which is just the grid based x y, and use Dijkstra's algorithm to calculate the value of that heuristic. But why don't you just use A star then on it? Because on any any problem, Dijkstra runs a lot slower than a standard A star search. So why wouldn't you just use A star to calculate the heuristic, ignoring uh, the orientation changes? And then, of course, there's other there's jump point search, which yeah. which would make it a lot more efficient. Yeah, you can do this, but um, the idea here is that um, once you get the to the obstacle map, you want to pre-compute the heuristic for every state. So with this Dijkstra, Dijkstra value iteration, you, all of you will get all of this in one, one sweep. Because you, once you're expanding nodes, you don't want to recompute over and over again <coughs> towards the goal. But again, if that's a big environment, then, then, then that would be a problem. But it's, it's, it's compared to the, the XY theta search afterwards, uh, you can make that. It, it, it's, it's a, of course, it's more overhead than just taking the grid distance, but usually, if if your robot cannot step over these obstacles, then it's worth it. So, I, it's something yeah, I understand. Uh, improving yeah. the heuristic is good. I just don't see why you would take a bad choice in that situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's well, it, it depends because once you get your environment. Um, so let's say you're expanding 10,000 of nodes here. You want to pre-compute the distance towards the goal. You can do this with a value duration starting from the goal and branching out. So you go, you start from the goal, and you, you're looking at every 2D state and just storing how far is this away from the goal, considering the yeah. obstacles. If, so you, you, you you're not looking at a single state and then computing the 2D path. <coughs> Short question: uh, This path, uh, in this path, the robot would collide with the wall. Is it correct? So yeah. So if this is a wall, yes. If this is a large pit or something. So this is uh, we're, right now. We're looking at two D obstacles with no sort of semantics attached to them. So mm -hmm. the only information robot has is that it cannot step on this. Mm -hmm. So white is steppable and black is not steppable. So here it's really going close, close to the wall. The wall. Yeah. So if this is a, if this is a wall. Uh, then you will have to increase the inflation radius of the obstacle so the robot stays sufficiently away. I mean, you, you always just take the stance foot into account, not the swinging foot. In this case, the swinging foot would end up in the wall. Yes, this is a wall. It's, yeah. okay. it's a small obstacle that you can step over, which, which the planner assumes by default. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, you will have to, exactly, while you're expanding the nodes, you will have to look at the, the swing foot paths and what they actually what they can pass over what they cannot pass over. Um, but you can you can um, directly fix this if you have some labels attached to the 2D map. It's 
sort of also implemented in there, which tells you this is a small obstacle that you can step over, or this is a wall. And then you're simply inflating the walls by uh, robot radius, and you will, you will walk around it. Um, well, I have absolutely no experience in robotics in this line. Uh, my first guess would have been you take some type of clients with, with points uh, uh, where you uh, have to uh, step. Uh, because obviously, it, uh, one point would be near the, the obstacle, and one point would be with the direction you want to be in for the goal. And yeah. And then you serve clients. That, uh, in this case, I think it's a valid point. Yeah. Then you can just use a 2D path planner and walk around the obstacle. Yeah. But um, we will get later to, uh, to some examples where we have lots of obstacles and you cannot even pass a 2D spline through, okay. which respects the robot, um, robot's uh, valid circumcircle or the robot's safety margin. Um, so this is assuming that you have lots of obstacles on the floor that you can step over. And then the question is where, how do you put your spline through that? And so we, yeah. That's why, in some cases, you, you really want to plan in this footstep space. And also, the, the next example will show you that there is some problem with that. Um, so now let's assume that we only have obstacles that the robot uh, cannot directly step over. Um, so the dike heuristic uh, is a good choice. And now let's simply take this wall, make it a bit wider, and make a hole through it. Now suddenly your heuristic or your spline will point through this hole, uh, but your robot cannot pass through this wall. Uh, so why does this happen? Um, in order to um, plan a valid uh, 2D path with this dike heuristic, we have to give it some sort of inflation radius for the obstacles. So we're planning for a point mass, um, but this point has to be some uh, safety distance away from the obstacle, so we're not stepping directly on the obstacle border. And if you think of planning for foot foothold locations, then the only valid choice would be the foot in circle. Otherwise, you won't be able to pass through very narrow cutters. So this is a conservative choice. So if you so start using the outer circle, then you will pass around a uh, sort of clutter that you may have stepped, be able, may have been able to step through. So now we're taking the foot in circle. And what this basically tries with the heuristic is to, to slide, because it's not thinking about the stepping capabilities, it's trying to slide through this, this narrow passage on one foot. Um, and suddenly we're expanding a lot more nodes again, um, and this takes 15 seconds to expand, whereas this takes only 2 seconds. And it's only a very, very small modification of the environment, we're not changing anything else. This is just to show you that even if you think that you have a very good, well-designed heuristic, it may lead you astray in, in, in some cases. Mm. You say uh, 15 seconds, what, what does it mean? So, here we're planning for W equals 1, so we want the optimal result. This is an A-star search then. It means 15, sec 15 seconds is planning time. Computational time. Computation time. For us. Your machine you're using, or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. this was a base MP or for so this was on a standard desktop, three okay. gigahertz i7, so we're not really we have a robot, but a desktop. So it's nice. It's more than we have a robot. Yes. <laughs> so, it, but yeah, it, it's just to compare the numbers. So, it, um, yeah, but it was on my desktop computer uh, for this planning configuration, one centimeter resolution, twelve steps, and so on. Um, so this takes two seconds if you look for the optimal result. So this is uh, the A-star search again. Um, but if, if there's only a small modification of the environment, then this, this heuristic will really uh, kind of fool the planner into expanding all of this again, even though we're looking for the path, and it will take 15 seconds. So if you don't know what kind of environment you're facing, it's, it's uh, um, kind of important to think of the heuristic. And um, there's only an example to show you that it's, it's, it's the planning performance depends on a well-designed heuristic. But all of them are not, uh, if we are running on a cortex, uh, it's all not the acceptable for. That's true, and um, that's why usually you don't want to plan for W equals 1, but you want to plan for, say, W equals 10, which would be 
0.1 second, and maybe you tell the planner, okay, I'm, I'm fine with if you plan a second, and it will go down to W equals 5. And there are other things you can do. Um, this is a very large environment, 5 by 5 meters, something like this, uh, with 1 centimeter resolution um, and 12 steps. Maybe you don't need all of this fine, fine uh, graded details. So this was anytime repairing A star with the Euclidean distance heuristic and the Dijkstra heuristic. Um, we've seen that the performance depends on a well-designed heuristic. So now let's get to the randomized A star, which was um, I've designed um, particularly to tackle that weakness because we don't want to end up redesigning heuristics for every kind of environment we face. Um, and if you're looking at the randomized banners like the RRTs and PRMs, then they're not facing these problems because they are exploring the state space in a very broad manner. So the idea with randomized A star is uh, to borrow kind of some, to borrow some ideas of RRTs with random expansion and use that again in an anytime suboptimal search. So again, we have guarantees on the solution optimality. Now there are probabilistic guarantees, but there are still guarantees, and we're getting um, goal-directed results. So how does uh, our star work? Um, to give you a, a kind of a short, uh, the short story is um, <coughs> that it's using, again, it's using weighted A star, but in every iteration, it's also um, placing sparse intermediate nodes at random locations around the current node. So say we, we've planned this path up to the state S. Um, now we're looking into a, any kind of random direction into a given distance delta, can be a meter away. And if there's no obstacle there, we're just placing a state there. And we just leave it there. And for footstep planning, we're just uh, we're picking the orientation to follow um, this random expansion, so we're kind of favoring forward working, and we pick the foot to be randomly left or right. And every iteration, we're placing a few of these random states all over our state space, um, and then we're looking at the connection from S to S prime. Um, and we're looking at now we're looking at this sub problem. Can we plan a path from S to S prime in a very short time? If we can do this. Then there's mostly free space in between, and then we have a valid plan, we just come and it. If it takes a longer time, then we will just postpone it for later, until we have to look at this path, uh, because we have to fulfill our heuristic guarantees. So, the important point is here, again, if once we lower our W, we'll ha eventually have to look at the whole state space, um, but we don't want to look at for a start, a start we want to branch out uh, random, more or less randomly, but we're still planning for these short uh, step paths. And because these are short, and sometimes there are no obstacles in between, they can be planned very efficiently. Um, so let's look at the R star expansion for the same example again. Here we're looking at W equals 10 again, and you see there are only very few expansions. And already for this fast result, I think this was 0.2 or 0.3 seconds. Um, we're getting a very goal directed path, which is, would be good to, to start with. But again, if we have time, we can improve this path over time. W equals 10, uh, equals 5, and you see here the clusters of where the random nodes were placed. And the robot starts expanding around this area at the third banner. W equals 2, it's branching out further, and for W equals 1, You'll see that this again resembles the A star expansion we had. Um, because again, for W equals 1, the planner has to give us the optimal result, so it has to look at all the states um, given by the heuristic. Um, so let's look at uh, some planning results in very dense clutter. And this is a kind of uh, 4 by 4 meter map with all kinds of obstacles placed in there. It's an artificial example, but it's just due to a very challenging scenario here. Um, and just to show you that this is indeed challenging to plan with A star for this short distance. 
uh, takes 11.9 seconds on my desktop computer, expanding maybe half of the map area here. Uh, if we employ R star on the same um, scenario, the, we'll get the first result in 0.4 seconds, and it's very close to the optimal path, as you can see on the left. Um, and this is with the Euclidean heuristic, because we want to use R star as a kind of replacement whenever uh, the heuristic choice um, is too hard for us to make, or uh, we don't want to risk any kind of stop return results, so we just employ the Euclidean distance of the heuristic. Um, anytime repairing A star, the same heuristic takes 2.7 seconds. And if we employ the Dijkstra heuristic, which should be more informed of the environment, but in this case, its leading is completely astray um, because it's not really admissible in this scenario. Now here are the aggregated results in the same map as before. We're planning for 12 random start and go locations in the map. They are all roughly 3.5 meters apart, so they're very similar scenarios, all going through the clutter. Um, here we see that any time pairing A star, we'll find fast results. There's the planning time only with the extra heuristic. The Euclidean heuristic takes a lot more time, whereas R star is kind of independent of the heuristic choice, so it's giving a fast results here. And the path costs, even though this is the only the first result for W equals five. W equals five. Um, it's maybe something like 30-40% worse than the optimal path, but the aggregated results for the optimal path are that you will have to plan for a minute or a few more. So the take-home message for, from, from this slide is that R star finds fast results even with the Euclidean heuristic in these densely cluttered environments with lots of local minima in the heuristic search space. If you look at a more um, realistic scenario, here we have a very large map, 8 by 8 meters. Uh, we have three rooms connected by a longer hallway. A um, robot walks from one room to another, and if we're planning all of this sequence with footstep planning, then there are some scenarios where the dike service is well suited. You see here, going through, it's only expanding along the studio path. Um, in, within five seconds of planning time, we'll get almost optimal result of W equals 1.4. Um, whereas R star takes a bit more because it's not as efficient uh, as any time repairing A star in reusing information. So it's running W A star, the weighted A star, over and over again. Um, but um, R star can actually reuse the state information. <coughs> so you see the random expansion, uh, so it's expanding a bit more. Um, however, if we have this hallway here blocked by clutter, so if we all consider all of these small obstacles here, um, then uh, the heuristic will now point around this obstacle blocking the path. Um, so with the interim pairing H star, we won't be able to find the optimal path. Whereas R star can deal with this uh, challenge if it will still randomly expand all of the state space. Um, so it's not uh, affected by these local minima. Uh, if you look at the A star, uh, the, the, the R star, with the clear heuristic, it won't be able, so this is not even A star, this is A R A star with uh, W equals 10 as initial W. Um, so we'll see that it will have problems with the local minima here, because the heuristic will point across that wall. So it fails, it means it ran out of memory? It ran out of time. So here we're giving the planner a time limit of five seconds because we want a fast result for navigation. So it fails to return a path within the given time limit. It will take 40 seconds or even 90 seconds for the first solution. So to conclude this part of my talk, um, we've seen that the performance of end-time repairing A-star, even though it's a really good improvement to A-star search, uh, depends on a well-designed heuristic, so that's A-star. Um, the likes heuristic um, can be efficient in some cases, uh, but it may be inadmissible and may even lead to wrong results. 
uh, whereas R star, the, the randomized A star variant, um, with the Euclidean heuristic, finds efficient plants in short time. Uh, if you think of, for example, the now robot, um, using the default walking behavior I've seen here, then this is mostly a 2D path. Um, so in this case, the Dijkstra heuristic is indeed permissible and a good choice. Is there some type of uh, on the color related uh, search strategies? So the randomized methods mm -hmm. something like that. are, I mean, they have this randomized data. Yeah, they have transition uh, probabilities and this is randomized, uh, I didn't get. So they, this, they have this kind of guarantee that given you do infinite number of uh, planning runs, uh, the infinite number of um, then iterations, you will find the optimal result. So this is the holistic component. I, will, I, I didn't maybe what uh, some, some some kind of transition probabilities, or I didn't find it clear ah. in your strategy. Mm. Not that I know right now. I mean, we we really have costs associated to each, each step, and we want to find the cost optimal. Uh, so there are no. There are things like planning in the belief space, where um, where each each action has a kind of probability or observability, yeah. like uh, where you can okay, plan these kind of actions. But not, not in here. This is always assumed that it's fully observed. I'm sorry, why is it that the dike structure can be inadmissible? Uh, because the dike heuristic will point around all obstacles. But if your robot can step over an obstacle, ah, okay. then it's mm -hmm. drastically overestimating. And this is what happened in the other scenarios. <laughs> so I understand that you from a point to another, but how do you um, decide which direction to point? For instance, you said the back right there. Uh, how does your algorithm uh, deal with that? So the, the full step planner, you can give it a number. So usually you. So, okay, so in the. It's planning in x, y, theta, and the, the foot space, so left and right. So the goal should be a set of footsteps, which have an orientation. Okay. In this case, and we'll see later uh, when you play around it in, in, in Arbis, you can just give it a 2D point of orientation, and it will place two right. feet there, and just walk there. If you don't care about the orientation, uh, you can just take like the next step that's very close to this point. And, and you can easily add this in. But usually you are interested in the orientation, and so that's yeah, here it's turning around towards the end because walking can walk backwards, but only with smaller steps than walking forwards. Uh, same way you could change the costs of walking backwards because they're kind of risky. You want only want to walk backwards when you when you have to. So that will lead to this behavior and not that robot turns around here and start all the way backwards. Um, so you're actually setting the vector theta yeah. rather than the algorithm. Yeah. So the start, st st start in this case are the robot's current foot locations. And the goal is x, y, theta, and then it will place two footsteps there right next to it. But you can also give it a set of footsteps at the start. So in one of your previous uh, maps that you showed us, there was quite a narrow gap between the wall. Can you footstep planning algorithm turn the robot to sidestep to yep. go through a narrow gap? Yeah, it can do that. Yeah, of course. So that would be done automatically or you yep. have to Auto So you only give it the orientation of the goal. You don't give it a preferred walking orientation. You can tune the preferred walking orientation if you change the cost of the steps. So if you say walking sideways is a bit higher because I don't really see what's going on there, walking backwards is really expensive because I don't see anything. You can do that, but the planner itself, it doesn't care, it, the, the footstep planner doesn't know about the robot's torso or head orientation. It only knows the orientation of the feet. Now we're looking at static environments and a known map and everything. Uh, 
so yeah, the question then is, when you deviate from this path, which will happen with a real robot, uh, the robot won't be able to walk all the footsteps exactly. Um, the first thing you will do is, um, the planner will give you the global sequence of footsteps. The robot walking control will take this global sequence of footsteps, transform them into a local coordinate frame, and then based on its current pose estimate, it will adjust the footsteps. So it, it, it won't just blindly walk on them, but it, if you know that um, my orientation changed for three degrees to the left, then you may be able to, to um, alleviate that by changing your local stepping capabilities if they're still in the stepping range. So this is what, what, what we're doing at the first measure. Um, so you're transforming the global footstep path to your current position, and you're looking at the next few steps um, and computing the recomputing the, the relative stepping motions. But then maybe you deviate so much that you cannot step on there, and, uh, and then you need to replan. And here is where the dynamic A star is really well suited. Um, it's exactly for this scenario. Um, this one part first is. Um, Deviations from the initial plan, which will happen with a real robot and it's walking, because volume motions will be affected by noise. Uh, but you can also deal with uh, changes in the environment. Also, the environment is, is usually not static, um, there are things moving, um, and they may affect some part of the plan, but not the complete plan. Then we can make use of the D star or its anytime version A, A, A D star, which is also in the FPPL, um, to take care of this. And, and what this does, just to give you some Rough idea, it, it will reuse the state information from, from previous searches during the replanning. So it won't do a complete replan, it will look at the states and then um, decide if it needs to adjust the cost of the state or if it will need to re expand them. Um, so, a first measure, what you have to do in, in this case is planning backwards from the goal. Because if you're planning from the start to the goal, um, goal should theoretically remain mostly static while your own position while you're walking will change. So you will have to replan from start to goal with different start locations over and over again. And there you cannot reuse any of the previous information, at least not the way that the star works. So by planning backwards from the goal, you can account for the case that your goal remains static but your own position is afflicted to noise and to drift. So then you can efficiently update the states leading towards the goal because they will only change a little bit. This is typically the case for any kind of localization running because uh, it will update your current pulse estimate. And this is what we've done here. We've been deploying the D star on a now humanoid. Uh, the environment is completely known. Um, and it's using the 2D laser rangefinder for performing localization. Uh, and walking slowly on the steps here. Here it is adjusting footsteps while it's walking. So there's quite some, some drift. You won't be able to walk open loop on the complete sequence without colliding with anything. Yeah. So this is one case. The uh, second case is replanning in the case uh, the environment changes. Um, you see this example here. Um, we have this obstacle. Um, the robot starts walking a few steps, and then the obstacle's location changes. Say this is a I don't know, it could be an enemy player which walks into your path. And if you replan now the complete path, one run will take one second, will expand 3,000 states. Whereas with D star, you will only look at the, the nodes that are actually affected by the obstacle. And you will be twice as fast in this case, it can be even faster. Um, and we will only re expand 956 states. So just a short overview uh, of this topic of uh, replanning with the star. But what if the goal, for instance, changes a lot? So do you have like a threshold that decides whether so you have to keep it or not? The goal in this change, it, it, in this case, may not change. Okay. If it changes, then you will need to replan both start and goal. I think there are planners for that, but they're really, really complicated. Right. Uh, otherwise, you, you will yeah, you will have to replan completely. I think, for instance, if the goal is the goal, uh, yeah, then your goal will be. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. Then, then forward planning will be better. Okay. It's, it's, it's better because then you will, you will, your goal will change more often than your own organization. So far, we've looked at the performance in, mostly in, in 2D. Um, so now I'm <coughs> briefly showing you some of the recent work by my colleague Daniel Meyer, uh, who extended this uh, to, to 3D. So here he's using a depth camera for visual perception um, in a completely unknown environment. So he's using scan matching to improve the odometry. Um, and in a heat map representation, um, we're then performing footstep planning um, not only 2D, but also with 3D stepping capabilities, so stepping over obstacles and um, stepping onto the steps as well. So we're using an ASUS action sensor here. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it's basically connect a lot smaller, uh, which enabled us to mount it on the now. Otherwise, the connect would be too heavy. I don't think the now can even stand up with it. Um, it gives us dense depth information, so it's really nice. Um, <coughs> Worked with stereo before, then uh, in your indoor, then the sensor is really great because we get the dense depth information, it's accurate and lightweight and very cheap. So, from this kind of camera image, we directly get this 3D information as point clouds. Um, so, as you definitely know, I guess, is that odometry uh, may be nice in a local environment, but it's affected to the serious noise with the human robot. So we have to perform some sort of post correction and since this is an unknown environment, um, we cannot just use a localization. Um, so here we're using uh, scan matching. Uh, what there is we have an odometry estimate of the robot which tells us how about walk forward maybe 20 centimeters. Um, but if we compare um, our observations then they don't add up. So we then we're performing um, GICP uh, scan matching here, um, which corrects the odometry pose and yeah, basically aligns the two 3D perceptions. GICP? No, oh, sorry. It's generalized ICP. The ICP is the iterative closest point. So, short story is that it's uh, looking at the. It's, you have two point clouds, the red and the green one, and you're looking at the differences of them, and then you're iteratively changing the second point cloud so there's it kind of snaps on the, the first point cloud so it will reduce the point to point error between the two point clouds and GICP is one variant of, of that uh, but yeah so this works in 3D on 3D point clouds um, and with this we can correct our volumetry estimate uh, and if we integrate now the scans over and over while we're walking uh, we will get a very dense high resolution height map which gives us the floor plane in white and everything that sticks out is an obstacle. Um, as you've seen, we're working with the now humanoid and I told you before that it cannot step over obstacles. Well, that's true for the standard steps because they're very small if you use the standard walking API. Uh, so to really get that fact, um, uh, my colleagues came up with a nice additional uh, stepping capabilities because the now can step much wider in the lateral direction and the feet are smaller in this direction. Um, uh, we have one more added step, which is this T step, which allows the robot to align with an obstacle in front of it. Um, then from this step, it can step over an obstacle to this uh, sideways direction, or also step onto. And this action um, will then step over the obstacle, check if it collides with the obstacle, Whereas this action is parameterized, uh, so we'll check where we can place the foot there and then dynamically adjust the height of the stepping action, aka inverse kinematics. And the same way for stepping down on of small obstacles. Um, the heuristic that was used here is actually the Dijkstra heuristic, uh, but it was well tuned for this environment, I must say. Uh, so the costs of an edge are the, given by the height map. For example, for this height map with some obstacles and a small staircase, um, we're transforming this into a 2D graph um, with an 8-connected neighborhood. And then on this 
this graph, first of all, we're um, um, looking at edges in the height map. So here we have edges that are very high. The robot cannot step onto this. This will get um, internet costs because they're not traversable by the robot. So here the two tiers go <coughs> around it. And since we know the stepping capabilities, we, we know the robot can, for example, step onto this platform or step over this. So this will get some medium costs to traverse this obstacle. And the white is the free area, so we have very low costs of walking around. Um, but here it's very important to, to tune this cost so you don't end up with an inadmissible heuristic. And then we have the stepping action, so we only allow steps onto either on the ground plane or onto obstacles that are mostly planar in the area of the foot. So they have a very small height difference there. The robot can safely step onto this. And then for every step, um, the target stepping location, so here we're expanding from state S to S prime, must be within uh, the stepping range defined by this action. So for walking in the plane, the difference is zero. These are the standard 2D steps. Um, but for stepping up a um, small stair, for example, or stepping over an obstacle, um, that's the maximum stepping range is defined by the kinematics of the robot. And we came up with some efficient uh, way to do this 3D collision checking for the whole body. Because now we're not only working with planar obstacles, but also stepping over. Uh, so we actually have to look at the motion that the robot performs. So if there's an obstacle here, we cannot just uh, bump into it just because the start and um, the goal foot are collision free. It doesn't mean that the whole trajectory is collision free. So for each stepping motion, which is not as 2D, um, Step, um, there's this inverse gate map. Um, this is a pre computed um, representation analogously to the hate map, but this is working in the robot space uh, around the stance foot. So the robot starts the stance foot here, um, then extends its step forward, and it's simply a combination of the complete motion, taking into account uh, the, the links of the robot from the CAD model. Um, and in each cell, the hate map is then storing the minimum height of the complete motion above the ground. Um, for each 3D stepping uh, <coughs> motion, we can then take this inverse hate map, put it or transform it to the stance foot, and then compare it with the hate map of the environment. So the action is safe if each cell in the inverse hate map um, plus the state where we're currently standing up with our sensor is higher than the maximum elevation in our representation. And this is not simply a 2D lookup, uh, so it's really fast. Because the, the collision checks are, are one of the most um, demanding part in, in your planner because every time we're expanding nodes, you're looking at each of your possible footstep candidates and you're performing collision checks in there. We really want to have this efficient. And here's an example. Run where robot really starts start at the right in a completely unknown environment. You see that it's iteratively building up the map and replanning around obstacles as it goes through because there are some unknown areas. The blue is everything is unknown. It's like the shadow behind obstacles, so it may have to replan when it's reaching this area. So you can also walk up and down small steps. Now since um, the stepping motions were manual designed with kinesthetic teaching, so basically the robot was demonstrating, was demonstrating the motion and then was checked whether it's statically stable. Uh, it's not very dynamic motion, that's why it's quite slow, but it's just to show that it's, it's kind of working. To even with now from any kind of, and here we have the example of walking sideways. So the robot doesn't fit through frontally, so the planner automatically um, plans a sideways stepping motion. Is all the processing being done on the now? No. 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 Uh, see the cable? Yeah. Uh, I think the only processing that's done is uh, executing the steps and serializing the depth data from the and then it's already pretty maxed out just just getting the the pretty point cloud data and sending it out. Even with reduced resolution at only 10 hertz. Okay. Okay. 
connected to the thirty hertz, but in a way that I now can handle it. <laughs> Maybe there will be an opportunity to put a sort of dedicated FPGA or something in there that's dealing with this kind of data. Why need to connect the computing PC directly? Why does it have to go over the now? Ah, so yeah, so because this gives us the opportunity to to get rid of the cable. So you mean to, to connect the connect? So it's it's attached to the robot, but it's going to the robot to the, to the, to the computer. I mean, it's it always nice to have the onboard sensing because it makes the robot a bit more autonomous. I mean, we, we can get rid of the cable, but this will just reduce the frame rate of, of the sensor. And then yeah, we're trickling over wireless. Just a matter of preference, and also the, the sensor data then is synchronized. All everything that's coming from the now is, is, is synchronized to each other, and it, uh, with respect to uh, time frames and stuff like that. Are you maxing out the network connection there? Is that the bottleneck, or is the bottleneck? No, the bottleneck is, is the is the atom atom port now. So you could conceivably do that over Wi-Fi in an ideal environment. Yes, if there's no disturbances, and if you're happy with, I think, two to three frames per second. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But there's another problem is that um, then you have to perform some sort of um, quality of service thing, because, uh, or you have to throttle the, the sensor down, otherwise it will clock your wireless and you won't get any other robot sensor data, which is, I think, more important than Model UDP or something. Yeah. Um, question: like, Before you were, <coughs> you showed the planning stepping onto the, the roads. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought I saw the video just planned only through the first step up to the second step. What if, like, after that, there was like another higher one to have to turn back? No, no, no. The, the, the planner is completely until the end. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, I, I just. So the ah, so then, then I think it was given an intermediate goal. So yeah, so everything that you see planned, the footsteps here, gets a complete plan. Um, yeah. Was, ah, okay. Yeah, because it, it doesn't see anything here. Yeah. Okay. That's why it goes here. And uh, yeah, if, if there's a higher step, then it will have to go back and, and walk around it, if, which it wasn't observing before. Okay, so the, the, the program is in, the, in Java or C++? Yeah, or? it's all C++. All C++ and uh, we mostly work in ROS, so it's all in. Your guess, if you, if you would go to Java, you will lose some of your time to increase, uh, of course. But, uh, Definitely for the 3D processing, yeah. I think. By, uh, by yeah, the factors or by uh, just a guess? Um, okay, I think somebody already knows Java can make So it's a final um, final part of our presentation. Um, you, you've seen the 3D footstep planning, 2D footstep planning. Um, but if you think of maybe an empty solder field, which is mostly cons consisting of empty space, then it would probably be a waste to just to, to plan 3D footsteps there or just 2D footsteps. But um, instead, you want to use the planner granularity adaptively as you need it. And even if you look at the small example that we had at the start, um, the obstacle is only here in the middle, so why plan footsteps all the way? Um, so I think we, we thought of here is to uh, use this adaptive level of detail planning, um, which will end up with this result that we're planning a 2D path up to close to an obstacle. Then around obstacles, we're planning footsteps, and you can go in further that you're looking at the obstacle region. If it's mostly two-dimensional obstacles, you're planning 2D footsteps. If there's 3D obstacles involved, then you can even perform the 3D footstep planning there. Um, um, but just keep in mind that this is different than planning a 2D path, and then planning the footsteps around the 2D path. We're planning the 2D path only in the open areas, and we're planning on all obstacle areas because only the footstep planner or the finer detail planner will tell us if this is actually traversable. 
if you plan a, a tulip path here where you had the example at the start, then this will either plan around it or plan through. But it won't take the stepping capabilities into account, whereas here we're planning these in an interleaved fashion. And just a very short uh, overview of the idea. Um, here we have an example 2D grid board. Uh, first, we're classifying this into regions that are sufficiently away from the obstacle. This is the white space. And obstacle regions. This is the yellow space, and it's including the obstacle. So the thing here is that the 2D planner, it, it won't be able to tell us if this obstacle is traversable. We have to ask the footstep planner. So in the yellow areas, we're applying footstep planning, and in the white areas, we're applying a 2D planning. And then in a, in a final integrated planner, we allow transitions between the eight connected neighborhood for the 2D planner, um, and these so-called contour points, because we don't want to plan for every point with footsteps across all different combinations. So we're sampling points along the contour of our obstacle regions, the red points, and here we're allowing transitions between the neighbors, but also between all of these contour points. And then between the control points, we employ the footstep planner, which then tells us that the actual transition costs from here to this other point. And um, in the final planner run, uh, we have a 2D path, which, for example, arrives at this point. Then we'll place some footsteps there and start planning footsteps around this area. So here we see the footstep planner successfully returned. Uh, so this obstacle is actually traversal by the footstep planner. Um, the traversal costs here, because we have to arrive at this point, and we need some estimate of how, how um, expensive it is to traverse this area. We can employ a very simple heuristic there, or we uh, can employ we have the environment in advance. We can do this in a pre-computation stage. Uh, the results in this large office environment seen before. Um, here's the tool path, it won't be able to pass through this narrow passage. Uh, this is with A star, so this takes 30, 30 seconds to plan the optimal path. And if you do A star with a combined 2D and footstep planner, we'll get less than one second planning time. And the actual path costs, so the cost of the robot to, to walk on this path, are only 2% higher. And the same way it's could be employed again with three planner if we have a classification that tells us that this is an area where obstacles are mostly 3D and uh, clutter that we have to step onto, or it's a staircase where we have to employ the staircase stepping capabilities. To summarize my talk, um, we've seen any time search based footstep planning. Um, with some optimality bounds. Um, I've demonstrated the ARA star planner and the randomized, AR, randomized A star planner. They're both in SDPL and available in our footstep planner package in ROS. Um, I've uh, demonstrated your replanning capabilities with anytime D star. We've seen how the heuristic influences the planner behavior and how important it is to get the heuristic right to your scenario or your environment. Uh, towards the end, we've seen the extension to 3D obstacles and an adaptive level of detail planning where we can interleave planners of different granularity and different complexities. Um, as a final outlook, uh, these are some very early results of the um, team bigger from Darmstadt and uh, Virginia Tech uh, in the Dark Rars Robotics Challenge here. They're actually employing our system planner with the Atlas humanoid. Um, in the virtual challenge, uh, which they successfully passed, so they actually get to play the, the real Atlas robot next, and I'm excited to see how this goes. And here you see a typical uh, scenario for footstep planning. We have the stepping fields, so only very narrow areas where you can step onto and get successfully manages this run. to see slightly green and red to see the footsteps that are planned to this location. Okay, so <laughs> thanks for your
if you have more questions now, otherwise, and afterwards, uh, we can have a short look at the footstep memory in practice. We have time. How long? Yeah, we have time for some yeah. some questions. Uh, and we can do the practical things after the break. Okay. Awesome. How do you compare this approach to what Nicola Perrin was doing about this uh, combined history continuous kind? Um yeah, so it's, it's a very different approach uh, since he, he's relying on the, on the randomized methods. Um, but compared to that, they have uh, very uh, more detailed stepping capabilities. Since um, so, um, maybe a small summary for the rest of the audience is um, um, they're having a set of half steps they're called. So it's it's uh, it's so if you think of footsteps, there are uh, stepping motions going forward. But if you divide this motion into two halves, then you have one foot up motion and one foot down motion. And so they have 200 of these half steps, which very finely discretize the complete stepping range of the robot. And then you concatenate them, so you have even more stepping motions. Um, but if you look at these half steps, you can actually perform these collision checks in, in, also in 2.5, because you have a foot up motion and a foot down motion. Um, and then they're planning, they're moving this um, disc, two, two half disc shapes, uh, which tell the planner that this, it's, it's uh, possible to step somewhere there through the environment with a randomized planner. Um, so it's a, it's a very different approach, or it goes in a different, uh, different uh, direction because it's relying on these randomized methods, it's a very high branching factor. And afterwards, the motion is smooth. Um, but for the stepping motion, uh, it's so in, in their case, it, it's hard to assess some kind of uh, ball directiveness or uh, so the difference with the animus methods that I, I had at the beginning. So, um, you want to speed, for example? So, you never compare, for example? I never have a direct comparison since I don't have access to the implementation. Um, so, I have some scenarios that are similar to their sample scenarios, but um, I'm not reaching. So, for a comparison, um, I would have reached their results with an A star planner first, and this was already faster than what they demonstrated. So, I think uh, there are some different in, in, in the encoding of the states there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so they're mostly comparing to A star, and um, <coughs> with this, I think it's it's fair to say that A star. Uh, will be too slow if you have a very complicated environment but for this. But for this end, I, I think these um, um, anytime uh, some optimal planners are a really nice choice because you, you know that the paths will be goal directed since it's a search. But of course, if you want the optimal results, you will have to look at all states eventually. Whereas with, with randomized methods, you if you look at the, the videos, you see that at some points the robot starts going forwards and backwards and, and, and turning circles because it is a, a randomized method. But yeah. Have you tried doing any of the, uh, the similar planning methods using the onboard processor? Because I'm wondering like, how much of a performance hit you'd be looking at compared to running your desktop i7 versus the onboard app. Yeah. Mm, I haven't actually. It's, um, yeah. Um, the thing is that I, I think it would take so much time for me to get into this, uh, like post compiling all this stuff. Mm -hmm. now that, so you, you would be just happy to get get Ross running on the now, and so we can talk to it with the, uh, the, with the driver, and then we can get everything off board. With the it's more, more convenient, basically. <coughs> yeah. On the same sort of topic, do you have any numbers on bandwidth and memory usage? Here. Bandwidth? Yeah, first network bandwidth for the sensor data and how much memory you needed to expand that state space. Um, not as much that it concerned me, so yeah. It's, um, don't have real numbers on this. So the sensor data, it depends on what you want to do. Um, 
So with the 3D camera, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So this is, um, I think if you take the full, the full connect data, it's like 10 megabyte per second. So it's it's maximal USB already. Um, so you really, if you have to throttle it down on on the sensor already. Um, so what we're doing, so you install an iDriver, you can tell it that you don't want a full resolution, so it's doing this directly on the sensor, <coughs> down, and, and this will reduce your bandwidth. Um, so it's on a, on, a, on, a, on a good wireless link, I think it's like three frames per second. Short question: By excluding the uh, stands foot uh, out of the state, uh, state space, uh, what are the real effects? I mean, you you always start with both legs parallel, and you always finish with both legs parallel. Not with both legs. No, so um, so it's not ex it's not ex it's not excluded. It's only excluded from the state transition. Um, Mm -hmm. So the, the global state that lives in the planner, it knows which foot it has. Okay. Um, so we can give it any kind of starting look. In fact, if, you, if you're planning with the real robot, then it will always take the robot's current stance, whatever it is, as the starting foot locations. Um, okay. What I meant is that you can leave it out from, from the state expansion because you know when you're on the left foot, the next one will be right. But of course you have to know that you have on the left foot because then you need to mirror your your foot set because you don't have the same set you know, the set on the left foot on the right foot. For the three D planning, I'm not familiar with the laser range finder on the now. Could you have used that rather than using the ASUS camera? Um, so I've mostly used the, the laser range finder. Um, the thing is that um, so it's 2D, so in order to, to get observations you have to stop and then uh, perform a 3D scan. Then yeah, you could have used that as well. And in fact I think it, it's more accurate than, than the ASUS sensor. Or in wheel. And it's also has a nice nicer field of view for localization. I think of the horizontal field of view is 24 degrees, whereas the, the depth camera is something like 50 degrees. But the, yeah, but you can use it while you're walking. You don't have to stop and perform some sort of 3D scanning. Okay. Um, so to prepare for some short live demo or planning around, playing around with the planner, if you have um, Ubuntu and Ross, then. These prerequisites. Um, I'm not sure if you really need the desktop full. I'm not sure uh, how well the wireless works and everything, but it's definitely. Um, you yeah, have Thomas TV prepared uh, some computers. Um, I'm not exactly sure which ones, but I think it's these uh, four computers and then probably this one and, and this one, but. I'm not exactly sure, so okay. yeah. So don't worry, I'll, I'll perform the steps here, and you can also just follow along and then look at it later when you're back home. And is is there an easy way to find out uh, if, if the computer is prepared? Um, ah, you, um, with this one? Yeah. Ah, you can do. Um, it no, doesn't tell you to run this command, it'll just tell you if it's ready to install. Yeah, you can do this or. If you go, yeah. But I think we, we do this after the coffee break. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there should be coffee outside, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank the speaker again. <laughs>